uh, we will have three speakers uh, and then it will we will have a debate as we had before the break and I would like to uh, invite uh, Faguni Guarai uh, for the first uh, introduction and I hope it will be a good injection in the debate which will follow so go ahead um, first of all thank you very much for inviting us to come all the way here and, and provoke you all and thank you all to come here and get provoked. I mean, you know. <laughs> so I'm going to do f something for the first time in my life. I'm going to finish a talk within five minutes, which I've never done. And I'm not going to use a slideshow. So if I end up going a little bit more, so you know because I've failed in my market structure. Right now, while we are sitting here, and we'll probably finish about 4 o'clock, give and take another two hours, in Nicaragua, there will be a very special event. The Ministry of Agriculture, in representation of the government, will be presenting to a very wide audience in a very big event its policy on how to promote the agroecological production of small-scale farmers in Nicaragua in the next five years. Now, you can call it an election stunt because the elections are coming. You can call it populist policy, but... If you really go through that little document of six, seven pages, and, and it's quite impressive to see that how they have been able to pick up on the things that we have been looking at for such a long time. But I want to just you to focus on few things that are in this policy, and I'm just picked up the part of the business and commercialization. And it literally says, we will, we meaning the policy, right? We will design a marketing plan to position the small farmers' agroecological products in our and our neighbors' markets. We will push for innovative ways of commercialization through auctions, farmers' markets, fairs, whatever it needs to take. There will be local and national certification to specially position our small farmers and their products. There will be a national strategy for education about the benefits of the small farmer agroecological products. Permanently, we'll inform the public and private sector through market intelligence about the products and their developments. The last one is quite classic, and it's incredible. It says, we'll promote the supply and consumption by obliging the state institutions like hospitals, army, and police to buy small farmers' agroecological products. Well, this is great. So you said, okay, that's done. Nicaragua has no problem. Small farmers... Forget seminar, forget the title, you got it. We'll have to see what happens. But if you go back in a document that was published in 2009 by the World Food Program when they looked at the food security situation and looked at the different initiatives they picked up on Nicaragua. And they put that there was a really innovative agri seed program. There is improvement in value chain. And they specially emphasized on a productive food program that is financed by the government since 2007 that is reaching out to 75,000 poor women farmers so that they can capitalize with the cattle and this and then become really active actors in the local food economy. And, and then medium-term investment to improve the seed supply and technology. So one would say, okay, if we are really interested about the policy environment, about small farmers, agroecological movement, whatever it is, well, this will be a nice case to look at. But this same policy structure has another side of the coin that we are not really reading, right? It says in the seventh, eighth point that we'll adhere to all the commitments that we have made to the free trade agreements. So that means we'll stick to CAFTA, which means we'll stick to ALBA, that's the trade agreements that will go on in the countries, and we'll stick to agreement of Acuerdo de Asociación, Association Agreement with European countries. So I will take next three minutes just for you to case two case studies very quickly. Let's talk about corn. We talk about food, that's what we eat every day, tortillas. So the corn production is a vital part of the economy of Nicaragua. Between 2000 and 2007, the production has increased from 350 to 500,000 metric tons. So it's quite big. Although the yield has not increased, so people have been planting more areas for these government programs or whatever it is. So you can say that production has gone up. The domestic consumption has gone up from 260,000 metric tons to 350. So, sounds good. It goes up the production and consumption goes up. And per capita consumption has gone up. 
So it means people are getting a little bit of money to buy a little bit more maize. I don't know where from. Maybe from remittance, maybe from wherever it is, but they are. But importation of corn, I mean, this is strange. I mean, you produce corn and you, but the importation of the corn has gone up from 20,000 metric tons to 140,000 metric tons. Is it, where is this coming from? Seven person, I mean, seven times. And the corn flour, processed corn flour to make torti has rocketed from 10,000 to 40,000. And especially from Maseca, Gruma, this is a Mexican United States capital. You have to remember Nicaragua has a free trade with Mexico has a free trade with the United States, so you can do a double triangling. I mean, that is three times as effective as free, free trade. <laughs> and Maseca is GMO, and that's confirmed by Greenpeace in Mexico. <clears throat> and Nicaragua has a policy of not importing GMO food. So, I mean, how is this happening? And this has been very clearly written up as an excellence of CAFTA. In the United States Embassy page, you can go and look at it, and it's very big. And people say, well, that's great because the consumers are much better because their price has gone down. So in December 2008, the price was 30 cents, 37 cents. In August 9, it was 58 cents, and now it's 48 cents. So prices have not gone down. So is the free trade just mining into all other kind of things that we just elaborated? Now let's look at what is going to come. In Nicaragua has been working with the help of NGOs, Europeans, Finland, whoever it is, the sustainable dairy production. And we have had a conversion of sustainable dairy production into quality, into agroforestal system and everything. So our production has gone up in 2007, about $110 million of products to about 272 in 2009. We're talking about jumping up 100%. We produce about 600,000 tons of metric ton of products and 90% of the product, not all, 90% of our export goes to the region. But strangely, all the imports come from outside the region, New Zealand and wherever it is, and even from Europe. Now, whoever has seen the at association, they will find out that we were forced. We were forced. This is forced to accept interests of at least 600 tons of milk products from Europe even with subsidy, without any tariff. It was a precondition. So we'll be accepting 600 metric tons, and it goes up by 5% every year since eternity. So in 50 years' time, we could import all our production from Europe and cheaper. So if you just do the triangulation of 600 metric tons into Nicaragua, and Nicaragua doing a sweatshop of maquila of cheese or something of European cheese and sending it to Mexico or United States, you can see a huge operation going on. And, and I mean, that opens up a dumping. So there would be dumping. So whole milk industry will collapse. So if you think coffee industry collapse is a problem because the small producer goes out of business, a um, cattle industry has 15, 20 workers in each farm, and they don't even have land. So that is a serious question. Now, two questions. Why are we, as policy, sabotaging our own effort? I mean, is it because the farmers don't have any position? We fought during the CAFTA, and we fought hard, and we won. The white maize was not allowed in the CAFTA to come into free trade. What the industry did is they took the yellow maize, and it was allowed, and what they're selling us is bleached yellow maize as white flour. And that is allowed, because legally yellow, yellow corn was allowed in the CAFTA. We didn't know that they had that trick behind. We only fought for white corn. And immediately it was done. What about the cheese and the milk? I mean, the few words that was written there and that triangulation will be stopped, will it be ever stopped? Now, one can say, you know, the market is a bad guy, you know. So he doesn't let you work, you know. So the market agents are not good. The private companies are not good. Starbucks is not good. But what about governments who are sitting down in these trade agreements and signing this between Europe, between Nicaragua, between Mexico. I mean, these are not some dark, you know, kind of in some hidden agent. This is open. And this is your and mine tax money and your and my life. So do the small farmers. They need to really get organized and expose this and then say, this, this is not about few pennies here and there. It's about taking the system right to where we want. So trade agreements, I think, has been avoided as an incidence issue. And we have just thought about negotiating or bargain on a little bit. And I think the profile of small farmers 
really, or the market's working for the poor, the first stop has to be trade agreements. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I think those who raised the issue of policies being overlooked, uh, this is, uh, I think, quite some provoking uh, um, information from Nicaragua to, for, to encourage further thinking. Uh, before we start the debate, we will have two more uh, persons providing uh, their provocation. Diego Munoz. Okay. Okay, thank you for, for inviting me. When I started to do up my ideas to provocate, my question wa was, who am I going to provocate? The farmers, the Bolivian government, the intellectuals from the northern universities, ourselves. So... My questions for some of you can be provocative, for some of you don't, or some of them who are watching us at the network will be more provocative than, than you. The, the, the issue I would like to talk about is this uh, issue of agency of small producers and uh, their relationship with the policy processes. Uh, well, I come from Bolivia, and Bolivia has suffered many important changes in the last uh, decade or so. Uh, in the past, before Evo Morales government, we had um, many development programs supported by international cooperation and uh, um, worked out by the national government. But these this, uh, programs, in many cases, did not work and did not work especially with small producers. So it was very clear that when public policies were going in one direction, social movements were going in a completely different direction, and they met on the blocking on the roads because the uh, public servant couldn't go anywhere because the campesinos were blocking the roads. So this is a very clear case of not finding the way that policies can solve the problem. Um, and... Uh, in NGOs and international cooperation have been very much engaged in not finding their way out. And uh, after Evo Morales became president of the country, uh, there was a really split between the national policies and the international cooperation. International cooperation doesn't know what to do today. So why is the reason of this? Why, why does this has happened? Uh, I, will, I will focus on small producers and uh, my, my interpretation and from many of the people that we are discussing this, it had to do with that the, the, the national policies and the international cooperation policies and also the organization policies were more related to uh, uh, pushing and working over the big issues which were related to the way their organizations had to carry uh, the problems and had to see how would they would they would uh, implement a certain policy. It doesn't matter where, where does the policy come from. So it was a very uh, uh, driven policy to get to the collective issues. So uh, small producers, I think, all over the world have these two tensions that have, they have to fight all the time. One is the collective perspective, being a collective body through their organizations because it's not easy to compete if you are by, by yourself. It's not easy to do no, nothing as you, if, if by yourself because you are a small producer. You have to have a collective body. But you have very, very single and very clear individual necessities in terms of markets and in terms of production. So uh, these two tensions are always presence, present in any small producer's bus business. So what happened in the past uh, is that uh, all the, all the um, energy of the policies and of the uh, uh, cooperation programs, they got into the uh, collective issues and they tried to, through the collective issues, change the things of small producers. And they didn't get into the small issues that had to do with wh who I am going to sell, how much I'm going to sell, when I'm going to sell, what I'm, to, what I'm going to do with the money I earn. Is it money for, the, for my kids going to school or is it I'm going to reinvest it for my production? 
So those personal decision issues were not uh, touched at all by any uh, or cooperation program or national policies or even the, uh, the, the leaders of their organizations. Well, because of that, many of the small producers, they got very well organized and decided to throw out the government because they wanted a more representative government and they were able to change the system and now a small coca producer is Bolivian president. Uh, so we thought that this problem was going to get solved and he was going to be able to watch at both ends and, and see what's going to happen at the macro level and what's going to happen with the micro level because he knows people very well. But the, the, the surprise for everybody is that the, shame is, the scheme is being the same. We have completely different policies in place. We want, uh, the government wants to really work with the uh, organi organized institutions uh, uh, and the, the, the representatives of the organization from organization because they have a political uh, power and they, they, are represented, they are representing more people. But they do not go down deep to see what the real market problems are from those small producers. Even the coca producers, they have this problem of price change and how to get into the market individually, how to transport their project, their product. So this is a matter of agency. So the conclusion about this is that uh, even it had, can be a, a neoliberal government where all the policies come from the outside, uh, or it can be a popular government, a very left-wing government, very close to Chavez. Um, they do are aware that they have to work with the organization and the big picture, but they don't know how to put policies in place that can work really on the individual base interest that has to do with their agency, that has to do with their day-to-day -day decisions. And those policies are not even discussed. Uh, people speak, it's, it's easier and more comfortable to speak about big things related to big organizations than to speak how are we going to help people to manage the small amount of cash they have? How are they going to manage their cash flow? Who is going to advise them on that? How is that decision going to be taken? So um, that part is not being, being uh, um, uh, looked at all. And I think that if that doesn't change, perhaps the road blocking will start again quite soon. Because people are not seeing that this government is doing something for their individual dreams or, or needs. And they see that it's only a big political picture and nothing is happening on the ground. Thank you very much. Thank you. So the, la the third and last person, um, sorry, Mohamed Sharif from Uganda. Okay, thank you very much. Um, just building from what Diego said. You know, when you talk about the value chains, where do we put the household, so-called small producer? What is their stake in it? Analysis has been done about value chains and all that, but are the, are the small producers really involved? The information that is flying all over is this even itself contradicting. You know, you uh, give prices about a certain product, but these are prices not well analyzed. They include other costs. They raise expectations of the small producers. They cultivate more products, and the prices go down. So there's kind of a clash when it comes even to the information. And there are many, many actors involved in this, and they are not coordinated. This one uh, brings a lot of challenges you know, in making the small producers also to have a, a correct choice what to produce. There are quite a number of dynamics also at community level, where we are looking at issues of culture, we are looking at you know, issues of you know, uh, group dynamics. You know, one person asked that you know, if, you, if you can be able to get a better price, meaning that you can get enough income, 
But giving an example of cocoa in, in the Bunbuja district in Uganda, 70% or, <clears throat> or 80% of the land that is being uh, used on, coffee, on cocoa, you know, you, you can get the income, but the prices of food elsewhere are also increasing. In, when you bring in issues of culture, that's, the, that's when the man decides to marry another, the second wife, the third wife, trying to look at, you know, splitting that income. And in the end, it's not even enough, you know, to sustain your family or change their livelihoods. According to the recent report, 50% of the children are malnourished in that district. And it is, the, it is a district that has registered a lot of income in terms of you know, getting cocoa, the prices are good, they're very good players, the lead farms are there, they can provide uh, some quality, uh, support in quality control and everything has been done. The market is okay, the market environment is spam, but the livelihood is questionable. You know, these are the issues that say, you know, who is the agency in this? How do we provide information? How do we make uh, uh, households or small producers, you know, reflect on a number of issues. The choice. Looking at also the opportunities that are in Uganda, you know, the, the opening up of the borders, you know. Uh, a, lo a lot, the, the, the food prices are going up, you know, there's a lot of demand. So people can only concentrate on these niche products and even do not analyze the alternatives. Probably with even less risks. And you concentrate on these traditional crops or niche products, that could be having even higher risks. People have gone into sugarcane uh, growing. A lot of their land has been uh, given out because they need to, to be paid per month. And is that enough? You know, many people are losing that land. And the moment you grow uh, uh, sugarcane, you know what happens to, to the soil. And it cannot be taken back into cultivation for any other crop for a very long time. So these are the challenges that we, we, we are looking at. The, issues of, uh, of the issue of governance. We may be talking about, you know, because of the, of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the market, we need to organize farmers, we need to put them together. But again, the, the, we have not nurtured these leaders to become more proactive, to face the market realities. And that one becomes a very big dilemma for us. How, you know, they, it will increase frustration, it will increase mistrust. And for them to, you know, to interface with the companies, farms, it becomes a bit difficult. So in that way, you find that there will always be, you know, a kind of a cosmetic picture. You know, we have the value chains, but again, the realities at household level evolving, the, uh, the household evolving, everyone in the household, you know, to kind of benefit from the whole chain becomes a bit of a challenge. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, as I mentioned earlier, I think the issue of policy has been uh, well addressed by uh, Fagunia, saying that national policies, which are in a sense quite favorable, might not have the impact as envisaged uh, in the context of free trade agreements. Uh, so you're questioning uh, well, the, the, the role of policies. Uh, we have said earlier it's being overlooked in the debate. You're saying, in, to some extent, Policies are one thing. I mean, there's also the wider environment in which these policies can work or don't work. Uh, and Diego is, I think, talking about the political space which is right now there in Bolivia, but which is still not allowing to have policies which are really uh, linked to the interest, in economic interest of small-scale producers. And um, Mohammed Sharif talking about, uh, well, are questioning the value chain approach and whether it's really addressing poverty alleviation at the household level. So I would like you all, I would like to invite you all for the debate. And again, first three persons as a start of the debate. I saw already somebody there. Yes, and over there. Okay, we start at the left then. When the uh, when ministers from the developing countries they visit EU or other areas, their request, Minister of Commerce or Industries or whatever, they, they request for free access to markets or free trading, keeping in their mind that most of them they are owner of those commodities or products which are exportable. While 
in their own countries, they are the biggest barriers. They create barriers uh, against the access of products from the normal and uh, uh, layman or common uh, uh, population. I can give you uh, one example. Let's say about Pakistan. There are two products, major products, agriculture products. It's wheat. We have cotton as, as well. And then sugar cane. Almost 99.9% .9 of the sugar industry is owned by the ruling elites, those who are sitting in capital. Their grandfathers uh, and then their dads and th they themselves, okay, they own all those things. What happens? The poor farmers, the small farmers, when their uh, sugar cane crops is ready, they bring it to uh, those industries, to uh, sugar mills, to sell it. The price which they, uh, they are being offered by uh, the mill owners is 10 times, 20 times lower than the existing market price. So what choice they have? Either they have to sell it immediately, otherwise they have to take risk to let it dry, this, this special uh, crops. I mean, the weight is something, that is the value. That sugar cane after a week or two weeks in that uh, high temperature, I mean, goes dry. Okay, so then they are on loss. Wheat, again, these uh, stockholders are uh, the rulers. They stock the wheat at the time of the harvesting, which is April, May, something. They bring out their, uh, their, uh, their wheat uh, into the market. So at the same time, the growers, the small farmers, now they do not have any place, any market to sell their product. So what they have to do, they have to listen and they have to, uh, to agree with the prices, which are again 50, 100 times lower than those things. So we have to discuss about one thing while we are discussing about make markets work for the poor, that in those country, developing countries, the lust and the greed of these ruling elites and this janta, whatever they are, I mean, that we have to discuss. To when, when you sit with them, you have to talk to them that you are asking us, demanding us for free market and free trading, but please let's talk about your own behavior and attitude that system systematically you people want to keep your own public poor. That's something which needs to be discussed. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. My name is uh, Sietse Vellema, Wageningen University. Um, Falguni, I'm going to give you the propagation back, I think. Um, I, I got the idea from your presentation that producer agencies in setting the agenda is not really a problem. Uh, you said in the beginning that it's interesting to read in policy documents that there are policies that are apparently favorable or at least fit uh, the perspective of smallholder producers. Um, then, of course, it's not always effective, but uh, I, if I read the invitation to this provocation correctly, uh, you stated that the problem is that there is a lot of talk about making markets work for the poor in absence of smallholder uh, producers. My question is, um, why does the discussion then focus so much on the contents of the agenda and so little on the agency of smallholder farmers in setting the agenda? And if you follow the implication of that question, uh, the discussion in this room could be on what then are the mechanisms uh, that enabled farmers' organizations, cooperatives, in setting the agenda. And uh, I thought that Don Lorenzo uh, made the argument that fair trade then was a kind of vehicle uh, through which producers could set an agenda. And then I don't mind whether that was a very effective um, instrument in terms of economic benefits, but if you have the, the discussion on producer agency, I would like to encourage you to appreciate uh, or at least to detect the mechanisms through which farmers were able to set the agenda and see whether you can support and replicate them. Thank you. That was the third one, eh? Yeah. yeah. 
Um, maybe one issue I didn't hear much yet uh, today was the whole issue of gender. I think some of us are also members of the AgriProfocus Gender and Value Chain Group. And there you always see two streams, either on the one hand you have the gender people, on the other hand you have the value chain, chain people. We hardly ever meet, you know? The gender people don't understand value chains, the value chain people usually don't uh, really focus on gender related uh, constraints. So I think we should take uh, that challenge as well, because here work for the poor is a bit, for me, too bit too general. We should be a bit more specific here, I think. Okay, thank you. I would like to ask Faguni to respond to Sitz's provocation. Um, my reading into the situation is that small farmers and small households, not just farmers, um, beyond just the commercial organization, now at least in Nicaragua and Costa Rica too, has a certain amount of political clout. And it's not only related to the election or ballots. Uh, because it, it takes some time to really convert this organization into a social movement. So at least in Nicaragua, we have seen this grow over the last 10 years. Not only just farmers, but also water movement, the agroecological movement, the women movement, and there is a parallel growing of the social movements. And there's a lot of question about the internal cooperation is now a good amount of funding is not going to the NGOs, but through the social movements, and which is very positive. But they cannot have a, you know, like legal status to receive money, so somehow they have to do something or the other, but that's another question. But if you look at Nicaragua, I, nothing really big happened in the last three governments. Because, like Diego said, the doors were closed for the so small farmers, even to the, in the table of the policy debate, national policy. Now, 2007 onwards, that has opened up. So they were invited into consultation before, but now they're invited to really do input. And if you look at this policy document that is being presented today, the draft, third, fourth draft was presented by the social movement. So sometimes they're selling that the government is stealing our document, which is great. I mean, you, know, you want the government to steal your documents in terms of policy. But when it goes to the trade agreements, there is a social movement also. I mean, we want to influence, but the question is that we are protesters. They were not really participating in it because the way they're, they're negotiated is a completely different structure. And we said that in 1988, the problem with GATT or UNCTAD or Ronda de Uruguay was not that we need to negotiate, but the way you set up the process of negotiation will always exclude people. And uh, in the CAFTA, the, the, the farmers' movements and social movement came in strong in Nicaragua. But we knew that we were going to lose. And if you look at the vote in the assembly, everyone voted for it, all the parties in favor of the CAFTA. And because we knew, because both the parties had enough business in it, they, will, they saw a huge opportunity of doing business. So it's no question of moral, no question of small farmers, no question of policy, it's money. So you can make business, so let, let's get it done. Costa Rica was more intelligent, and they fought. And I'm, I'm glad that they have a case during the three days. They have actually documented the social movements of the TLC, the CAPTA movement. And you know what they got? They got 136 exclusions that we didn't get because they waited for the three years and really fought the discussion. So it shows you that if you have the guts and if you can negotiate, you can question is that our governments hurried up. In case of the European agreement, the social movement had two big issues. They wanted to get the water of the list because I don't know if you guys know, but European Union wanted free trade of water from Central America. They wanted to buy our water free. And that was the biggest issue, that water was not for sale. And the whole energy was so much put on the water, 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 it went under the our control that milk went from here and bread went from there. And so you couldn't control. And there were lots of small tables and negotiations, and we are not participating. So in the network that we have, I have proposed and we have proposed that we are not only going to look at the policy, but we are looking at the policy making dynamics at different levels. Now, small farmers agency at the level of the trade agreement, small farmer agency at the level of local policy, small farmer agency at the level of territorial policy, it needs to be much more sophisticated and developed. Now, this is a great opportunity to alliance. But the question is that we're never going to get the trade agreements right if we don't have a social movements on this side. 
if you guys are organized in social movements, not just farmers, but consumers, because you're going to eat and, and we organize in social movements, then we can sit together and get to get, see the right kind of trade agreements that will be fair. Otherwise, it will always be. Now, the question is that why are always trade agreements against? Because they were set up to do that way. The whole idea of trade agreements was to set up and to liberate the small farmers and get the industrialized agriculture get over the scene. So, so my answer to your question, the agency is there. But we sometimes, so I'm Nicaragua, Costa Rica showed you that one did and one didn't. Uh, free trade agreements with European Union were done too quickly, too right. So we didn't get it right. Um, and too many trade negotiations at the same time. Nicaragua is negotiating Mexico, United States, that's over. Then it was European Union, and then it's Thailand, and the Indo uh, this, uh, Taiwan, and then it's Panama. And th th you know, after all, we are 4 million people. And there are no more than 40 people who are thinking about this. How can, then you just, you know, run over, you know, you just run over the capacity of doing this. Yeah. Okay. One reaction. Um, you are still talking about the social movement, no? Getting, tr uh, trying to get influence in the, the government agenda or the, the, the free trade uh, arrangements. Uh, shouldn't be that uh, one of the uh, added values of a value chain? That as a value chain, you can organize your lobby and then with the big farmers, small farmers, etc. and have much more impact because who are, are lobbying in the United States or in, in Europe for these free trade uh, <coughs> agreements? This is also the, the industry. Mm -hmm. So organizing or getting links within the value chain can have a massive effect on free trade, I think. I don't know if the dialogues are permitted, but I'll respond to that. <laughs> the social <laughs> yeah, movement yeah, of Nicaragua is called Maunique. It's called Movimiento de Productores y Productoras de Agricultura Organica. So our value chain is agroecological agriculture. That is the value chain. We don't believe yeah. in cocoa or coffee or butter. The value chain is production agroecological, which is broad. It has humans, which is equity, which is environment. So we are in a value chain. And we're in a better value chain than this little bit peanuts. And because it, it helps us to see the bigger picture. And uh, you're right, we are in a value chain, but the value chain is in different level of agroecological production, and that it helps us to negotiate policies on a different level. Uh, and like, if this policy come into the effect, so the hospitals not only will have to buy organic coffee, mm. also yeah. organic rice, also organic maize, and organ, so, I mean, we have to see, because then there is a buyer in the hospital who has one of his foot down into the corruption, how to dislodge that man from his business that he had during the last 15 years. So this will all come into the position. And government, some government officers have kickbacks. So, but you're right, it is a value chain. But it's not that coconut or cocoa, but it's a bigger name value chain. But I think the question is also about the actors in the value chain. Eh? How can you collaborate more effectively with the other actors to influence policies? Yeah. Yeah. There was... Did I see somebody? Kuhn? Yeah, is it on the same topic? Yeah, yeah. okay. And then about uh, <laughs> negotiation, but also about government policies. I think the, the, the point that is made is that smallholders normally have little vote or little strength or power in that sort of negotiations and have little attention in government policies because of the lack of organization. And uh, I think if it comes to chain analysis, uh, the, there are quite a few chains where smallholders have a dominant position. Uh, the, the majority of the production comes from smallholders and still they don't have a negotiation power because of lack of organization. Now that lack of organization, first of all, is different over the world. I think in, in, in Asia it's, it's, it's stronger generally. China, Vietnam generally have, have a stronger organizational power at smallholder level. But Africa is extremely weak, as far as I can see. Uh, and I think that all the efforts that NGOs or, or social movements or whatever have put in, in stimulating organizational capacity in Africa did somehow fail. And we are not very self-critical in that respect. We are not asking ourselves why. But we, we are expecting more or less in terms of inclusiveness that that organizational capacity can increase without knowing how to increase it. And I, I feel that's an, a, a major challenge that I hope the coming days we will address in some way.
Okay, are there people over there? Yes, Joost, and then. Kun, you're entering now area, maybe, okay. Should go a little bit back. I don't think, I work now for a long time in Africa, and don't think farm organizations are weak. I, I've seen very good examples, and um, maybe I skipped to that because the, this, the discussion was not about that, but maybe you can come back later to that. But maybe stop with a little bit uh, the simplistic view on the farm organizations, please, for this. they are so diverse, and they have so, so much mission, so I want to learn more about that, and not about these stereotypes of uh, especially not on Africa. <laughs> okay. Hmm. And there was another person. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my name is... Does it work? Uh, Noortje Vaart, and I work for uh, the Royal Tropical Institute. Uh, and we are working on bringing together uh, like value chain, the value chain framework, um, uh, to call it like that, and uh, gender work that we are involved in. So we are actually trying to indeed build the bridge between people in value chains and uh, gender experts like the APF uh, network is doing, what was just mentioned. Um, and actually what we, what we see is when we look at, for example, mechanisms that uh, contribute uh, to gender inequality uh, in value chains, that is very similar to looking at why, for example, smallholders are uh, excluded from value chains. And what we see is that um, uh, the, a social analysis or a power analysis, if you will, is often lacking in value chain analysis. And I think that would, would actually be a very strong point of a value chain as a framework that allows you to look at these social issues, to look at power relations, and to look at, for example, why a farmer organization has negotiation power or not. And then, of course, you can't look only at the, the le on the level of the value chain anymore, but then you do need to look at household level, for example, what actually happens there, community level, um, uh, government policy. So I think what has happened with, with like looking only at value chains is that Indeed, the broader context is some sort of some is something additional. While well, actually, this broader context says something is reflected within the value chain, just like like, like activities in the val value chain are reflecting what the context is about. And I think that can't be looked at separately. And I think gender is a very good example where you see that very uh, uh, strongly, where actually female farmers of women who work on uh, a farm are often not even part of uh, discussions because we don't have that, that framework. We don't make the uh, analysis. Um, so, yeah, that was a... Okay, thank you very much. Diego, you would like to respond or react? <laughs> not exactly to respond, but I, I would like to... Uh, for me, this, in the debate, something is missing, and it, it's this this agency issue between organization and individual needs. Uh, we have always the tendency to to go and say you are organized or you are not organized or you are weak organized, and I think that uh, as as the gentleman there says, culturally, the word organization has many, many, many different. Uh, uh, manners of understanding. And for one culture, an organi organized group is a very unorganized group for another culture. So to put a value on that, I think it's one of the dangers. Uh, and, and that does not make us see where the agency problem is. So I, I, uh, from, from what has happened in Bolivia in the last years, people became uh, more... Uh, committed and willing and knew what they don't wanted from the foreign political system. And they organized through their own ways of getting organized. Uh, and that was something that has nothing to do with, with external intervention. And they were able to have thousands of organizations of organizations of organizations that got together on a common issue and said, okay, we don't want this. We don't know what we want, but we don't want this. And that's, that process of identifying what people don't want uh, collectively 
has to do with and strengthens the uh, individual perception of how life should be. But once the, 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 this position gets, gains power and, and, and takes the government, then it comes the same cycle again, because one thing is to understand the public issues and one thing is to really understand the individual issues. And this tension between individual needs and individual agency with the global uh, environment, I think it's a constant thing that is going on in all societies. And we are not able to work on that tension. Although we work in organization and big issues, or we work on the chains and the market and the price and, and something very... But we don't have the broad picture that should work should go together. And many times these two things have positive, uh, uh, opposite tensions and, uh, and, and you have to see both. And I, I think we all are failing on that and that's why we never can get to the small producer's agenda and I think the, the fair trade case is a good example of that. Okay, thank you. I think there's something coming in uh, from uh, outside this room. Okay, I have an interesting comment to Diego, actually, and maybe a question um, for Mohamed from Uganda. Um, a question coming from Uganda, actually. It's interesting to hear from Diego that small producers in Bolivia decided to change their government in view to change policies that directly affect them. We, right now, we are right now in an election period in Uganda, but farmers seem not to have any agenda to inform the leaders to what, about what they want, but instead <coughs> they are sending the vote. So... Maybe it's interesting to hear from Uganda what is going on there and uh, <laughs> why that might be and what opportunities for the producers. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> What's going maybe on? True, maybe <laughs> correct. Well, it depends on the analysis. Because if you uh, try to make the analysis in Uganda, there are many incumbents who are especially on, when it comes to the National Resistance Movement Party. A number of ministers have been thrown away. If actually they were to be given money, the same people would have surfaced. I think the issue of people are now getting more aggressive, they are becoming more analytical. There are a number of issues that are pressing them at community level, markets and all that. Many leaders have been thrown away, and they are a new set of leaders. I think we have lost about 60% of the old leaders. In my own <laughs> district, over 70%. So I, I think when it comes to issues of handouts, I, I don't agree. There's some level of civic competence at the moment. A lot of work has been done. And when you say organizations in Uganda <laughs> are not organized, they are more organized, but depending on what they're doing. I can agree with you when it comes to markets and influencing markets uh, with you know, influencing and debating on issues of uh, markets with the government, they are still weak, they are still learning. And there's a lot of knowledge that, that is required for them to, you know, to engage in that area. We have different programs, like uh, National Agriculture Advisor uh, Program, uh, with NADS, but it's particularly looking at production and it's looking in two phases. At first, they had some challenges where the, uh, they had a number of contractors and, you know, the, the whole procurement process. It was not really good. And the farmers were losing out, and now it is changing, which is an opportunity that they have to look at direct subsidies to the farmers. They have to decide what to produce and what quality of uh, inputs they need. So there are many things that are changing, and uh, we are trying to look at how best we can improve this agency to make sure that the, the, the number of civil society organizations or NGOs can be able to, you know, to debate, apart from the human rights issues and all that, how do they influence government on issues of markets. Here we are talking about COMESA, we are talking about East African community. And again, we have some farmers who are producing, and especially we have a number of processors. I'll give an example of, uh, of Jewish processors. They have to import the syrup from Egypt, from, uh, from Kenya. What's happening to the pineapple farmers? They will always say they can't meet these requirements. And again, other programs so for, from the NGOs are promoting production. So it's kind of a contradiction here. And this is something that you know it needs some high level engagement with government. Either to, and you can't do that because the policy and the agreements just say you don't have to levy any input taxes. So when you get even a product from Egypt, 
for example, th that price is a bit cheaper than uh, what is being produced in Uganda. The cost of production and all that, so you'll have never compete. And of course, they will need to get the raw materials which actually now can be able to, to compete with the other products, other foreign products. It's quite complex. Thank you. Thank you. There was, okay, I think you were there first, and then we have here one person, so it's getting busy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> on this issue of how far does a value chain analysis really cater for, is it a pro an appropriate framework? Is it good enough? I think in the research community, that has already been answered, that question. Because many people have gone beyond uh, a value chain analysis proper and go into what is called the global network school. Huh? And they recognize that this one thing are the functional interdependencies between actors in the chain, but there is also a societal embedding and there is a territorial embedding. Yeah? And that territorial embedding is then uh, where you look at the household framework and, and a household participating in multiple chains, for example, which influences a lot. What is, uh, what is the autonomy or the dependency of that particular household? With regard to the uh, societal embedding, uh, one looks at issues like uh, the role of the state, particularly state uh, business relationships. So the question of interest representation would be a key area where one looks into. Um, and what else? Uh, there was something else I wanted to say, but I've forgotten it. Anyway, you can find that in the book. That, uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and then finally, uh, the question of, uh, of the state. Uh, wh how far do we go in, uh, what do we ask from the state? And there is where, um, what is it, uh, Diego was not very clear to me. Uh, to say, to talk about the daily necessities or the daily things of a, of a household doesn't really tell me what is really what you ask from the state. Are you talking about uh, an old-fashioned uh, state that hands out all sorts of things to, uh, to, to households and households and associations depending from the state to do all sorts of things? Or are we talking about a more strategic conception about what is the role of the state in enhancing small producer agency to produce in markets? And that means questions of how to organize research and development and make it uh, work and, and respond to what are the questions of small farmers that relates to questions of finance, and that re relates to questions of training. And I think these are the kind of strategic issues that, uh, that I would say one, one ought to focus on. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. you want to I, I, I would like to bring something which was discussed in the previous uh, portion, and so that you don't go back home with the, with, the, with the message which was delivered that if farmers lose out on farming, there are better vocations for them outside. It was the example of Holland was given to us. But in India, we're uh, a billion plus, 1.1 billion uh, to be very specific, and there are no alternate avenues for us. So the state role in terms of smallholder is, is very tricky in a, in a sense. Uh, the unemployment at the farm level, where 60 percent of the population is currently engaged, uh, has led the state to develop policy for rural employment guarantee, uh, which ensures them 100 days of you know, employment guarantee. So this is a state response to increasing unemployment of smallholders at the rural level. So look at this one dimension of it. If you look at the economic growth model that I talked about, which is aiming at 8.5 to 10 percent growth, the idea for the state is to, to remove as many people from, the, from farming and bring them down to urban areas. Now this is so because if, if we have to continue to grow in the manner in which we have grown in the last few years, the mineral uh, resources in the country would need to be mined more efficiently and more effectively which essentially means that the small uh, small holders the tribal population the bottom of the bottom of the pyramid population need to be rehabilitated elsewhere so this is another scenario which is developing and within this scenario which is a larger you know the, there is a social unrest there is a violence which is emerging in at least one sixth of the districts in india there is a very serious matter so, so within this scenario, larger scenario, we're locating value chains. So if sometimes when you look at value chains and the policy atmosphere which is coming along, you see there is a quite a bit of dichotomy between the two. The policy is not supportive of the value chains, number one. And if it is supportive, it is supportive in a very small places. It's not a you know, you know, nationwide phenomena. So you know, there, there are contradictions within the whole system uh, which, which then, uh, under which we have to operate, number one. And secondly, the challenge of keeping the farmers doing farming 
because they're contributing to about 50% of the entire national food security is very critical here. So therefore, all, I'm, all I've said before, and I want to reiterate here, is that vulnerability of the farmers is very critical here. So any amount of action that you do, if it adds to vulnerability even by 0.1, that's a serious business in, in a place as vulnerable as India. Mm -hmm. OK, yes, <coughs> Um in, a bit in response to Diego's uh, presentation, I want to restate the importance of producer agency or collective action in value chains as, a, as an interesting um, model to, uh, to look for that. Because one of the things that you saw in, in, in Bolivia that producer organizations are, are very yeah, diverse, like, uh, like uh, uh, Joost Nele said. Yeah, there are ethnic divides, ethnic defined farmers organizations, there are territorially defined farmers organizations, and there are uh, commodity-wise or functional economic farmers' organization. When you see the process of uh, Evo Morales' government, the economic farmers' organization have been excluded. So perhaps one of the, way, uh, the, 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 the solutions for getting a better uh, government uh, outreach to, to farmers in, 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 in markets is to re-engage with, with those farmers' organizations which are tilted as neoliberal and... Uh, reformed liberals, and they are really not the, uh, the chosen ones of the current government. Yes. Um, but, but talking about the agency and, uh, and what has been mentioned before, um, I was wondering if, if you had invited here the president of Peru, what would he be saying? He was just at the UN boasting about the great success of his government. For several years, several governments in Peru have been trying to get all these free trade agreements with everybody, mm -hmm. Chile, Seu, uh, Korea, whatever, the European Union. And now he's boasting everywhere that, well, for the first time in history, poverty has uh, reduced drastically. So the argument would go that, yes, markets work wonderfully for the poor. Mm. And the m more markets, the better. So, yeah, thinking of these uh, contradictions and the, and the levels, and I, I, I was wondering if, if we're not just uh, looking at the wrong questions, because maybe markets work for the poor, or shouldn't we be asking ourselves how to make markets work with the poor? Mm -hmm. as, a, a, as a different entry point. Anybody who would like to respond? Yes? Yeah. Si. Yes, thank you for giving me the opportunity to make reference to this topic. You are right, the income per capita in Peru rose from $2,000 up to $6,000 per capita. And this income per capita, how has this been distributed? It's very important to take that into consideration when you study the situation. And we have to make that clear. For instance, the small holders, and do not only speak about coffee producers, but in general. What is his yearly prices are good, then there has been a good harvest. For instance, 84% of the small holders in Peru do not get $200 for the production per month. And they have to work, and they have also to carry out all their tasks. So they have more jobs. And on top of that, in a case of tropical products, there is also the informal economy with the cacao, which will be sent to the other countries. Youth is working in formal sector, and they have a, a 0 0.5 hectare and to work there in order to be able to pay the studies at the university. The president of Peru does not give this example. For instance, last year, there were 27 deaths due to the protest from the native peoples. Why did they protest? We do not want to have uh, death people and blood uh, shedding. People want to have peace. Why? Because there is uh, mining activities which 
pollute their uh, life sources. And these are damages which have not been offset by others. Therefore, people are protesting. How can we get development activities in Peru if there's not an inclusive process going on? In a second place, these uh, lands which currently are in Amazonia will be given to the state and the state uh, uh, sells them by tendering them to these large farmers. What will happen with the l l small land owners? What will become of them? So that is the issue which is at stake with regard to how to face the future, how we can get a fair society and how we can get a more inclusive society. When we speak about the smallholders, for instance, uh, in our opinion, we do not want to have a uh, charity. No, we want to have opportunities to live, to develop our country, we want to have opportunities to uh, develop our capacities and this on an equal footing. And this relationship with regards to fairness, access to information, for instance, um, with regard to capacities, and we want to base our activities on what happens in Colombia. There is also a tariff on commercial activities. For instance, Juan Valdez uh, um, is opposed to what we want to achieve. We want to have a tariff of one or two dollars uh, of a tariff on the coffee bags which have been exported. However, this will not be carried out. So what can we do? The smallholders, we have to organize ourselves themselves. We want to have an impact, and that's the process uh, which is interesting to us. So in Peru, we have made a slight progress. We have, for instance, organic bananas, and this in a marketplace, that's okay. But when we speak about uh, trade negotiations, it's very difficult, very difficult to carry out the smallholders. Cacao is being organized also for the smallholders, so small producers, um, they, of course, cannot have an individual link to the market, no. They have to organize themselves if they want to have a link with the marketplace. So what happens with politics in these countries when we speak about trade agreements, for instance, what happens there? There's also other issues at stake. When we speak about the so-called developed countries, we are very jealous because you have uh, subsidies for the agriculturists. But in our countries, we get less and less funding from the government. We have not a so-called compensatory system when there is damage caused by uh, trade. And what will happen with the smallholders? These participate in the negotiations, but these were represented and articulated in these negotiations. Now, of course, it doesn't happen. We speak about trade and marketplace. This is an opportunity for us because uh, we should not only manufacture for food. No, we have to take into account the future generations. We want to be healthy, we want to focus on our uh, children. So what can we do? How do we get our means and resources? We need to have a proper price which offsets our efforts and, of course, and a price, a price based on fairness. And that is important for us. And that's a challenge in front of us, all of us, we acting as consumers, because on behalf of the consumers, we can uh, make large programs for development and links with uh, the marketplace. And the consumers do very well know how the products uh, come to their table, how much it costs, and how much damage has been made. This is a challenge, and that's important for the smallholders. We have to focus on opportunities and not on uh, charity. Thank you. Much. Um, I think we're about to uh, well to end the seminar and the debate. Um, it's almost four o'clock. Um, Di, you would like to say something? Um, of course. No Go ahead. <laughs> Two no, no, minutes, no. Max. <laughs> no, one minute. Uh, I think it's a new time. Um, I don't want to glorify internet or computers or communication, but I think uh, they, they will have a role. I mean, I can talk about two cases. I talked about 75,000 women who have been part of the program, of the national program. Finally, they are tied up with a system that they can communicate with the system with their cell phone, very low quality cell phone. They can see what's happening, who is selling, who is earning, and what is happening. 
Now, you don't have to have all in one block. They know what's happening in their community, and they know what's happening in their bigger community, but they will know about 70,000. But now, all of a sudden, there'll be some leaders emerging because they're seeing the big pictures. So it was not that easy for someone. Some younger people will take interest, who will be also more efficient in writing and putting pictures. We just got, uh, last week, the, the farmers' movement, Maonik, are working with us. They want their 45,000 members, not want to, 45,000 members to have a little information about their farm. And every three months, they want to know what we have produced, what you have sold, to whom, and what is the investment that is offered, so that they can take this information very easily and go to their whatever level, municipality or whatever, and say, you know, are you trying to fool us or what? This is your policy, and this is what really is happening. So, but this is like a policy incident. So, one of the new things that will happen in next five, six, ten years, and it is already happening, is the communication, the cell phone, internet, radio, all connection. And, and I think it, many people will become cynical, but also many people will become active because you will know, it, know a lot and you say, look, you know, this is what's going on in the world. I don't want to read the newspaper anymore. But some people will say, no, I have to change this and go on. So especially the young people. So if we are interested in this new energy that is coming up, we have to be. Uh, I mean, I, I'm glad that this is being streamlined and online, but this has to be a communicating all the time, all the time. No? So just one point that we have not touched. At one point, we have to talk about small, poorer we are, less and less resource we have, more need to b make the big jump of the technology. Mm. The rich people can sit at their home, no problem. But the poor has no way. We have to get up on the technology. So I don't know. It was not in the agenda, but I it's a useful addition. Thank you for that. Um, Looking at the, the idea of this seminar, uh, it was to provoke debate, to really see if we could, some, could put some new insights on the agenda related to the whole concept of making markets work for the poor. Just out of curiosity, I would like to ask a few of you to share what they have learned from this debate and what they will bring back home. Anybody, any volunteers who would like to share that? Yes. Actually, this idea of a value chain, this is the solution to, to fight against this monopoly of uh, uh, those, I mean, back in developing countries. This is uh, the field where the West can play a very concrete and constructive role for, uh, to, to build, to create a part partnership between the civil society, NGOs, and uh, the farmer uh, cooperatives, whatever it is, including the pri uh, public sector, including uh, uh, those from the government side, to, to, to get them, arrange them on, on a table to discuss about the issues. OK, this is something which we have, value chain, and this is something where we can build together. So let's share, I mean, together, whatever it is, so to, to solve the issues. So nothing can assure, I mean, our future unless until we go into this uh, value chain system and to, to break the monopolies. Otherwise, this will continue, I mean, like mm. it, it has been in the past decades. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, Willemijn. Um, now, what I learned uh, this afternoon is that maybe you can make have some comments you know, on the government policies and trade agreements, but it's not so easy to be fro very pro 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 provocative <laughs> about the value chain concept. Uh, no, I think uh, the, the value chain concept uh, is still there, and it was not that easy to de deconstruct it. And as I understand that the scientific world understands it already, now the rest of the world has to do it still. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> My name is Edith van Walsen. It's, it's not working. Ilaya, yeah. I can talk also without, but you can hear me. Uh, well, I, I take a different message home, and I rather would like to confront you at the end of this uh, session to really, well, 
think, well, maybe I, sh I sh well, let me say, value chains, it's a great thing, but it's not the answer to many, many problems. And let's think with and beyond value chains, just like Robert Jorge was saying, making markets work for the poor, value chains is, 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 is one approach, but one has to go wider than that. And I'm a person with half a leg in value chains, and I have a leg in gender issues. And I've worked too much with women uh, to hear from them many stories about you know, what is their perception being in value chains? Being with one half a leg in a value chain and being with one and a half legs outside the value chain may be for them a very wise survival strategy, not a negative lack of options. It may be the wiser option in the context that many poor rural women, and not only women, but also men still have. I just would like to put this before you. You may disagree with me, but uh, I like to put it. Okay, thank you very much. There's two more. I think you've started the whole session of provocations, uh, Aided. Two more people. Vishwadeep. Um, Vishwadeep, I work in, uh, with Hivos in India. So when I ask the question, what, uh, what can markets do uh, to work for the poor, the market said, organize the producers into value chains, and that's the path to emancipation. But going back to what Mr. Sharma said in the morning, is that the reason I, I think that 200,000 farmers that committed suicide in India, they would not have committed suicide if they were part of some value chain? I completely agree with Edith, which clearly shows that value chain may be part of the problem, but uh, part of the solution, but certainly is not the only solution. I think one of the gaps that we've uh, not talked about when we ask what the markets can do is the issue of investments. I think it was mentioned that agriculture rate in India has declined uh, to less than 2% when the economy has been growing uh, close to 10%. There is a reason for that. And over the years, there has been a decline in both public investment and private investment. So is it fair to ask the markets, would you invest in agriculture? Market says possibly that's the state role. State says we don't have money. But for any industry to grow, if we have to take the analogy of manufacturing or services, it's always the market that has brought in the investment. Maybe the state has made the environment conducive for the investments to come in, but which has not happened in uh, agriculture. So value chain in that context, even if it were to work, uh, I think what the message that I take back there is no conclusive evidence as of now to suggest that uh, value chain has worked or if it has worked indeed that it has got people out of poverty. I mean, these are two totally different things. Assuming that it has worked, how many farmers can it work for? 10,000, 50,000, 1 million? I mean, that's mm -hmm. an island in a, uh, when we consider at least 300 million farmers, small farmers in India and growing by the day because of land fragmentation and all. So in re response to what markets can do uh, to work for the poor, we've got one solution apart from looking at the policies, which is value chain, but I have questions in terms of the scale uh, in which value chains need to work to make a difference to the level of poverty that exist in developing countries. Okay, thank you. Then the last person. <laughs> Yeah, it's, um, uh, it's interesting that uh, the value chain concept has caught on so much. Uh, that in itself uh, should be a surprise. Because for many years we have been working with macro concepts and uh, national accounts have helped making macroeconomic analysis very popular. Because you can just push some buttons and you have the accounts in front of you. Uh, Value chain concept is something that works with not with standardized data sets. That's part also of the problem. Yet, value chain analysis is something that has caught on. And I say that's something that, that, uh, that we need to reflect on. How is that, how is that possible that, that that actually works? And that it also has worked across disciplines. That is a second surprise for me. 
And I think the reason is, is that it is an integrative device. It connects different things. Uh, and I think uh, what I take from this is that I hope that we can construct further bridges, make use of the ICT, uh, and see to what extent we can also facilitate here from the north uh, with further sort of cross-country and cross-continental comparisons and that actually serve all in the study of the impact of value chains. But I must remind everyone, value chains is just an analytical tool. It is not something in itself. Yeah. Thanks very much. Thank you for that. Um, I would like to invite Bill Forley to uh, say what he will bring to the next provocation. As I mentioned in the beginning, this is just the first of a series of provocations. Uh, so, Bill, could you share what you will bring to the next one? Thank you, and thank you for such a great participation today. Um, much of the dialogue and debate around the learning network, of which you've heard some of today, will be held in the, s in the regions in Asia, A Africa, Latin America. But some of it is here in Europe, and this first provocation is our, has been our opportunity to... Um, to put a fire under the backside of, of the debate. And um, I, I've enjoyed it very much. Uh, this, as, this is a rolling series, and I, I, I think we sh if this is something that you see as ha having value, I would ask you to pass the information, the links to, um, to your, net, your own networks so that we can roll this along and build interest and carry lessons from one to the other. The next one being in, in Stockholm in January. Uh, you can't think of any more, anywhere more romantic than Stockholm in January, I'm sure. Um, I'm, I'm also asking the, the uh, series uh, partners to meet at 4.15 in ISS so that we can have a a bit of a, a debrief over what worked and, and what can be improved. Uh, that's, that's, the, we know who you are, um, who, uh, who we can have a little bit of a debrief. What I take away from this, uh, these three hours, uh, I, I want to come back to Sietz's question and the, 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 um, the title of this uh, provocation that is, really not to focus so much on the agenda but, or, the, or the smallholder problematique, but to see how, see where, where there are mechanisms and modalities for smallholders to shape this agenda. Uh, the agenda, as, as we've discussed, has been one where organized producers can cooperate to compete, to link with receptive uh, uh, and inclusive business, and that the, those producer organizations and businesses are tilted towards each other around a favorable institutional environment. And what I hear from today is the political struggle for that institutional environment to tilt it towards agency and inclusiveness. We heard from Lorenzo about fair trade. Fair trade is a is an institution of, of, of empowerment, but it has turned into an institution of power. And so there is, a, as well as a, a struggle for Lorenzo's organizations to compete in the marketplace, he has to struggle to protect the institution from being tilted away from his, uh, his, his members. He has to struggle to make sure that the, the, the tax regime where there's 15% on asparagus and 30% on smallholder coffee, is there and not tilted to, 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 to away from his members. We've heard from a Uganda where there, there is a, 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 a very rapid growth in demand for agricultural produce, but there is a community under stress and the ability of smallholders to meet that new demand is highly constrained by uh, struggles over land, over capital, of distrust of leadership. We've heard from India, again, a, a, an area of rapid growth, but where that growth is pulling away from the countryside, leading to frustration, unrest, and potential instability. We've heard from, from uh, Nicaragua, where there is a favorable uh, policies, 
cool projects, but an, a macro environment that potentially uh, can trump every one of those good initiatives. And we've heard from Diego how um, a political space built on activism, built on political capital, is not much better at the old regime at building economic capital and the, 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 the old existing needs around quality, production, and, and, uh, and um, entrepreneurship that, that, can, that are consistent whether you have a popular government or a liberal government. So I, 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 to me, I carry forward that, that message about the struggle for the institutional environment to make markets work for the poor. And I, uh, that's, that's my little nugget that I carry through, and I'm sure you'll take your own nuggets, but please, let's roll this series through. The next one is on rights-based versus market-based approaches to development, and whether that's a false dichotomy. And I think that in the depths of the Swedish winter, we can have a nice bonfire of debate there. So thank you all, and thank you also to One World Media for streaming this uh, to the world. This is our first try, and um, uh, I think we can we, we've, I think we can build on this example, and also for our, may I also thank the, the panelists from, from myself and, and for the chair, but I, I hand back to you, Carol, to close us up. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>Well, I think you've given a very good summary of, of the debate, the different inputs. Uh, I think we had a very good debate, very constructive, very interesting, challenging. I will also bring back home some new ideas and insights. I'm not going to share that right now. That will extend the, this seminar for, again, a uh, few more minutes. Um, as Bill already mentioned, there will be other provocations as well. You're invited to participate, maybe not physically, but then through the web stream you can actively contribute. We've given it a good start. Ah, there is the site uh, where you can find all the information. And, uh, well, you've seen that the input is being integrated in the debate. I think today we had a number of people participating in the debate, but I think we need to spread the word really, to make it more lively as well. Thank you very much for your contributions and wish you a good trip back home. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Just for continuity yes, sake, go ahead. Those who participate in the DPRN project, uh, the drinks are waiting for you in the bar, and at 5 o'clock the dinner meeting, 